All right, right now we're talking about attitudes and attitude measurement. My name is Mike Knutstrup. I have an MBA PhD from Florida State University. We're going to talk about the components of an attitude. Cognitions, affects, and behavioral intentions. And we'll talk about the relationship between job satisfaction and performance. Job satisfaction being one of those heavily studied attitudes. And also measuring job satisfaction and attitude questionnaires. All right. The three components of an attitude. All right. Attitudes backing up here are evaluative statements. Favorable or unfavorable. Uh, objects, people, or events composed of cognitions or thoughts such as my company is an outstanding place to work. Affects or effective, effective components are feelings like I, I love my job. I feel really good working there. And then a behavioral component of an attitude I has to do with intentions or behaviors. Like I intend to stay there the rest of my life. I'm going to show up early tomorrow because I like my job. Something like that. All right, so three components of an attitude are cognitions or thoughts, feelings, and behaviors or predispositions as a result of your attitude. One, uh, <clears throat> one of the most commonly studied attitudes is job satisfaction. A lot of surveys and studies done perhaps questionable whether or not asking people how satisfied with their job is, how useful that is. But the surprising thing is, out of a lot of studies, job satisfaction does not seem to lead towards higher productivity. A happy worker is not necessarily a more productive worker. You know, job satisfaction does affect turnover, as in, um, people are satisfied with their jobs, are less likely to quit, they also seem to treat customers better. People who are satisfied uh, tend to have uh, higher customer satisfaction amongst their customers. All right, so there's a little relationship here. I'm going to draw this out, okay, with uh, abbreviations. Job satisfaction does seem to lead towards, has not have an effect on turnover or quitting, it also has an effect on customer satisfaction. So which of these are the independent and dependent variables in my little relationship here? Well, job satisfaction is independent because it's free to vary. But turnover and customer satisfaction are dependent variables because they depend upon the level of job satisfaction. So what are the relationships here between job satisfaction and turnover and customer satisfaction? Okay, well this relationship is negative because as job satisfaction goes up, turnover goes down. They move in opposite directions. All right, job satisfaction goes up, turnover goes down. Job satisfaction goes down, turnover goes up. This relationship, however, is positive. As job satisfaction goes up, Customer satisfaction tends to go up as well. Happy workers treat customers better. So speaking of questionnaires and asking people, let's talk a little bit more about measuring attitudes. Okay. You know, that's one of the most common ways of, of finding out how satisfied people are is, is an attitude survey. A little bit questionable as if, as if, uh, you're going to get totally accurate responses by asking people a question, how satisfied I am with my job. Or think about this question, how satisfied <coughs> are you with your pay? Okay. Or if we want to phrase it as a statement, I am satisfied with my pay. One to five. One being strongly disagree. Three being neutral. Five being strongly agree. Well, that creates a little conflict, doesn't it? Because if I answer, if I'm happy with it, then they're not going to give me any more money. If I answer, if I'm unhappy with it, that looks makes the company look bad. But maybe I'll get some some money. So it creates a little conflict of interest. And asking people about attitudes. Uh, so there are other ways to to ask. 
perhaps uh, getting at job satisfaction, like looking at training records, maybe how people have done a training or volunteering for training, maybe at aggregate, aggregate medical records, for example, would be another way. You can't look at individual records, but maybe on an aggregate basis. You can see about uh, medical costs. When people are unhappy, maybe they would be more likely to uh, get sick and have sick days. All right, but anyway, backing up, attitude surveys uh, maybe the most common way. Some companies survey their workers every year about their attitudes about their jobs. And there are different types of questions we can use. There are closed-ended questions or forced response or forced choice. The typical one is done with the Likert scale. And the Likert scale is 1 to 5, for example. 1 being strongly disagree, 2 agree or somewhat agree, 3 neutral, 4 somewhat agree, and 5 strongly uh, agree. All right. Uh, and what are the benefits of closed-ended? Well, what's an, what's an example of a closed-ended question? My company has fair benefits. One to five, strongly agree to, strongly disagree to, strongly agree. All right. Or another one might be, my school has sufficient parking. One to five, one being strongly disagree, one to uh, five being strongly agree. So the advantages of closed-ended questions are that they're very specific. You get what you, what you're interested in. They're also very easy to administer and tabulate. People don't mind um, doing closed-ended uh, questions that much. Um, they're quick. They're easy to uh, to uh, tabulate and run statistics on. You know, you can do it on a scan sheet and run it through a computer. Uh, so there are many advantages, but there. But but the disadvantages are, are as well, you might miss something. If all you only ask about is one area of someone's job or one area of someone's school, you might miss something altogether. So that's where open-ended questions come in. Open-ended question. What's one thing I would change about my job? What's one thing I like about my school? These are open-ended questions. They're free response. They allow people to expand and, and extend. A lot of questionnaires will go like a several closed-ended questions, and then a few open-ended at the end. You know, is there anything else you would like to add? You know, do you feel strongly about any of the questions? So at the end, they have open-ended questions and allow you some, some free response. The advantages of open-ended questions are that they don't force you to respond. Um, they're individualized. However, uh, surveys with all open-ended questions are very wieldy. They take a lot of time. Sometimes people resist answering them, you know, like an essay format. They don't have the time. They don't really want to be singled out. Uh, they seem less anonymous. And they're, they're very unwieldy for the uh, administer. Uh, because how do you put, you know, say you get answers all over the place and how do we put these into categories and how do we average them and how do we draw conclusions so they take a lot of time and they're costly typical survey will have like I mentioned several closed ended and then maybe a few open ended at the end that allow you to add a greater depth or take it uh, in some area where where they might have uh, Miss. So that's all I want to talk about in terms of measuring attitudes. You know, the components of an attitude were cognitions or thoughts, affects or feelings, and behaviors or previous positions towards behaving. Okay. We talked about the relationship between job satisfaction and performance, which, uh, you know, it's hard to say. Generally, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, research has not found a, a strong link between job satisfaction and performance. Happy workers are necessarily uh, more productive workers. Maybe that's because they're happy. They're not motivated. It's like last year's champion. Why should they be motivated? They already got what they want. Okay. And then the, uh, the attitude surveys. Close and open-ended questions and their uh, advantages and disadvantages.